All right, welcome to this session on building a secure and compliant app on Azure Governments. Uh, Zach, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Zach Kramer. I'm, I lead the team that does the actual engineering work on Azure Government, and we make sure that we build the product that you guys need to build apps on. And uh, my name is Steve McLeay. I'm also on the engineering team at, at uh, Azure Government. You know, um, I'm a little bit newer to the team, so Zach is like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of <laughs> Azure government, okay? And so I've been a developer for years. I've built lots of applications, but a lot of the work I've done has been in the commercial space. So uh, through the course of the presentation today, Zach is going to help me understand how I build a compliant app. So now maybe you've been a developer for years and you've, uh, you know, you've been following security best practices, but what does it actually mean to build a compliant app? in the government space. And so Zach is going to help me learn that today and, and work as we go throughout uh, the presentation. Now before we start diving in <clears throat> to the details of compliance, we want to just take the first few minutes to discuss what is Azure government. Um, because I think it's really important to have that, that baseline, that foundation of knowledge to understand what is Azure government, how is it different than regular commercial Azure, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So we'll spend the first five, five or ten minutes on this. So what is Azure government? Um, there's a couple of key points that we really need to take away here. The first thing to know is that Azure government is its own sovereign cloud. It's its own sovereign cloud. It has dedicated data centers. So whereas you know, a lot of the technology that we talk about with Azure Gov is identical technology to what you would see in Azure Public uh, or Azure Commercial. It's really important to understand this is a sovereign cloud, dedicated data centers. You have physical isolation, network isolation. So it's not going over the, uh, you know, over the same fiber that you would be if you were right on Azure, re regular Azure uh, Public. Also, these data centers are, uh, the data centers have uh, screened U.S. persons working in the data centers. And, and that's another important uh, part, especially when you get into compliance, because it's very important, you know, who is working in your data center and um, is that all verified. And also, uh, all of the data is going to stay within the continental United States. So a lot of times when we think Azure's worldwide prevalent, uh, pr uh, uh, presence, we're talking about data centers that are throughout the course of the entire world, whereas with Azure Gov, we're talking about in the United States. The data always stays in the United States. So we'll, we'll talk about a, a few of these other points as we go along, but the main takeaway here is dedicated data centers and a sovereign cloud, dedicated to federal, U.S., uh, state and local uh, civilian organizations. <clears throat> so. When we talk about uh, federal cabinet agencies, we have 100% federal cabinet agencies that are on the Microsoft government cloud today, and here's uh, the listing of them. And in addition to that, we have state governments, 50 U.S. state governments on the Microsoft uh, cloud today. Uh, 600 million users, 7,000 fed, state, local govs. Now this picture here is <clears throat> of Azure Worldwide. And you see we have 38 regions, which is twice that of our closest competitor. And I show this slide because I think it's important to, even though, yes, we're not going to be talking about worldwide Azure, we're talking about Azure government, I think it's important context to understand Microsoft's global reach throughout the entire world. And this gives some additional uh, just context to the amount of resources that Microsoft puts into this. So when they're building the, the largest cloud platform in the world and all the, the billions of research that goes into, for example, security, that's benefit that all Azure customers get. Now, let's focus in on the regions we have in Azure government. There's two, uh, our two original regions, east and central. And you see these depicted on uh, the map right here. And then in addition to that, we recently had two additional DOD regions that have spun up similar geographic locations. We'll talk about these DOD regions in a little bit uh, more detail, but understand the main differentiator is these can do uh, DISA Level 5 uh, certification, so DOD workloads are appropriate for these uh, locations right here. And then in addition to that, we have two more regions coming online, uh, Central and West, later this year which is going to bring our total number of regions to six, which happens to be six times more regions than our closest competitor. Um, and this is also important because these data centers have at least 500 miles 
of physical separation. And that's an extremely important yardstick because when you think about disasters that can happen, whether it's a natural disaster, a catastrophic earthquake, a terrorist attack, whatever the case may be, you want to have your application set up in such a way that you have geo-redundance, so you're able to fail over to another uh, region uh, that is at least 500 miles away. Difficult to do that if you have your app deployed in one data center. Um, and these are, some, uh, these are some additional key differentiators that we have with Azure Gov. In addition to the data center locations, we have express route locations. Express route is a technology that enables you to securely connect from your on-prem data center into our Azure cloud. In this case, we're talking specifically Azure government. And this is another key distinction here is that our US government express route are dedicated for Gov. Some other clouds may piggyback off their, their express route technology in, in their public space. In Azure Gov, our express route locations, our meet me points are dedicated to our government customers. So you have dedicated fiber that go, is going between your data center and Azure to securely connect. It will not go out to the outside internet. Um, and we have an entire uh, talk, 75 minute talk at Tech, at Tech Summit tomorrow on express route if you are interested uh, in further diving into that technology. When we talk about compliance, Azure All Up, there's a ton of compliance that goes into it. 53 compliance offerings you can see on this slide alone. Of course, the one we are really focused in on this hour is that second row that says US government. So we have FedRAMP High, FedRAMP Moderate, we have DISA Level 2, 4, and 5, uh, ITAR, CGIS compliance, and uh, the number of certifications is growing every day. So I mentioned CGIS, 24 states, if it's 24, 26 now. The number is hard to keep track of the number because it does seem to increase every month. Um, but the states that we do have cover more than two thirds of the current U.S. population. FedRAMP 32 services are currently in scope of FedRAMP. We had FedRAMP moderate in 2015, FedRAMP high last year, and as I said, 32 services covered. You heard me mention our new DoD regions. So we have the regions in Virginia and Iowa. And what's, again, the critical distinction here is that these regions now have L5 compliance. And L5 is the highest level of compliance you can get for uh, unclassified workloads. And so this is a huge differentiator uh, that can enable DOD uh, workloads to go onto our cloud. The Azure Government Marketplace uh, came online last year and we just had a slew of offerings added to the marketplace. And just as a general comment, uh, you can see in the last three months, we've been pretty busy on the engineering team adding capabilities to Azure government. You know, if you were someone that looked at Azure government a year ago, you might have said, ah, okay, it's got the basics, got, I can do some websites, maybe some storage. But if you haven't looked at it in a few months, the amount of innovation that's happened just in the last three or four months alone has been staggering. And if you look at the parity that Azure Gov had with commercial a year ago versus where it is right now, it's, it's staggering. Um, you know, how much has come, especially in the last few months. Okay. So, with that, remember the introduction here. So, I'm a developer. I have years of experience uh, being a developer and building solutions. But now I've been given a task that I need, need to build a compliant application. And I've just heard some horror stories that I have to read through thousand page documents and you know, I don't really want to do that. I'm an engineer. I want to write some code. Um, how am I going to How am I going to get this done? So we're here to help you out, Steve. I think we have a few answers to some of this stuff. So um, if we come back to this slide real quick, um, I think if you could imagine the amount of work that has gone into uh, achieving all these compliance measures, and so um, and literally, I've I've seen them printed out, but some of the the SSP documentation and things like that that reduced thousands and thousands of pages. These things are like reams of documentation that are happening there. And we have whole teams that are working on this. But uh, as Steve said, and I come from a background of writing software programs, I want to think about how do I think about, how do I approach this as an engineering problem, and how do I think about compliance? And so kind of the first place you could look, right, is you could go back and read all the rules. So I think the, we, I was looking at the DOD cloud uh, security requirements guidelines, it's uh, 224 pages <laughs> printed out. I, I did print it once and read through a chunk of it. Um, 
It is not riveting. Um, and then if you look at FedRAMP, there's over 421 controls that you'd have to look for. And then kind of the, the NIST guidelines that underpin all of this are, you know, if you're reading through all that stuff, you're over 500 pages. And then, as I said, our security requirement documents that we write and generate are over a thousand, uh, you know, over a thousand pages long. So what I want to say is, is no, you don't have to read through all that. You can begin thinking about kind of some fundamental principles around how you approach that. And this is where, um, what we talk about is where do you have responsibilities and where do you share responsibilities with Microsoft, okay? So on top of Azure government. We, th we think about this in four general buckets. So today, if you're running on-premises, um, you own it all, right? Now you may benefit from, you know, the data center sits on your physical soil and is all controlled by your operations team, but there is a stack that is top to bottom that is managed and made compliant by your teams. Uh, the next thing we talk about on the continuum is kind of infrastructure as a service. This is pretty popular, virtual machines, things like that that are running in the cloud. This enables you to take your traditional apps, bring them up to the cloud. Now, what you begin getting there as you look at this and, um, is that the, you know, things like the data center, I don't have to worry about physical security, uh, but I'm still responsible for things like the operating system and stuff like this. As you move up the stack into higher order services that are more like a platform as a service, you begin looking at, I don't have to patch the OS anymore. The OS is, is abstracted from me and handled by Microsoft. I don't have to necessarily think about you know, how some of the brokering and middleware layers are operating. I can focus more on my app and the data. And then finally, <coughs> software as a service such as Office, you're focused you know, very much just on the operating of the system and you really almost all of it is taken over by a provider. So we're going to focus on those middle two buckets today because Steve writes apps. He's know a little bit more about what's going on. So, yeah, what's up? Yeah, uh, go ahead. The question is, when they are on the on-premise, on are all the as a, a product and service? Yeah. And the combination of those is very complicated because we don't know the differentiate which one is going to be Microsoft, which one is going to be, shall I say, the, the platform. You're saying, just to repeat real quick, so you're saying if I have an application that's running both on-premise and in the cloud? Uh, yes, no, I mean, definitely. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but still is, is honestly, could be, be more specific. Um, so if you have an application that's running on-premise in the cloud, and this is, again, actually, this is a good, on this next slide, to think about. So what we talk about is we talk about, you know, all of the compliance things when you get down into the NIST and other places are broken down into these kind of control families. And as you look at these, these topics seem to make sense, right? Like how do I think about access control and things like this? So at any point and it, where you're looking at it, um, you, you can discuss what your ways of approaching different things are for your application. And so if your application includes on-premise and in the cloud, when you talk about something like access control, you're going to have to both discuss how you're physically doing access control to the resources. Then a chunk of it will be, well, Microsoft does access control and has already been vetted for the rest of my physical access control. So it definitely does complicate things, um, but you you will have to just you will have to work through both of those there as you look at that. Okay, um, yeah. So this is where as we're looking at this, and but you begin to notice a theme, and even as we look at paths, right? The the amount of responsibilities changes, but when you look at it, there's a few key things that we're talking about, right? Do I have the data secure and protected? Are people getting access to the data who don't need access to the data, okay? And for anybody, Steve, you've written applications before, <laughs> right? This is not an uncommon principle. Um, and so when we look at how do we secure the data, how do we lock it down, and how do we make sure only the people who need to have access to it have access to it, I can go a long way to making sure that I can provide the justification to my compliance team around how my application is compliant. So just so we have some context, we'll just do a quick, brief, informal show of hands of the number of people in the room that are already familiar with IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service. Okay, cool, most everyone in the room. What about PaaS, Platform as a Service? Okay. So, Maybe a few less hands, but but still a quite a few a, a large number. But basically, what we're I'm able to take away from these last couple slides here is, if I use infrastructure as a service, I'm already way better than my own data center in terms of the number of things I have to worry about because Microsoft is worrying about these orange buckets. But as I go to more of these higher level things, as Zach has said, I, I realize that oh. I, you know, I don't have to manage every VM and patch every OS. Microsoft does that for me, and that's one less thing I have to worry about. So, uh, you know, just a takeaway as we as we continue on our journey here. Yeah. Okay, and I want to make a quick plug. Um, so, our team has put together and tried to streamline some of this. And so, if you go to this website, we actually have done a more deep dive into as you look at some of those control families that you're responsible for. What are some of the ways to implement those in Azure? So, it's a good read 
when you're looking for it. We're going to talk about some high level things and get a touch on it of how you would implement some of these things in Azure today. But if you're looking for more depth, you can go there. And if you are really excited about compliance and want to write a SSP, uh, we'll help get you started. Uh, it's a thousand pages long with a bunch of blanks that you get to fill in. So <laughs> you can get going. Um, so the Azure Blueprint stuff is great for um, getting a jump start on your compliance and we'll be they're actively, we're actively working on more features and more automation to help streamline your compliance there. Uh, so as a developer, I can read a 1,000 page document, <laughs> as we saw a few slides ago, or I can look at this thing called the Azure Blueprint that can, I, I just see the word streamline in there and that's enough for me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, does, it is good because it does break it down and groups them by things that you're going to care about and things that you're going to be thinking about as you're building applications. Now, as far as this Blueprint, if let's say I'm in an organization that needs to do FedRAMP versus I need to do DISA level four or level five. Is the blueprint the same? Is it different? Um, yeah, we have a blueprint that's for each of those. So you can think about the different types of compliance that you're doing and what your application is focusing on. Um, so if you're focused on building something for DOD or focused on something for, say, CJIS, we can, we can help you with both of those. Okay, so Steve, you and I were talking about an application beforehand. We talked about you know, I think in past lives when we've worked together at different points, I think we've all built an application like this. Has anybody ever built a three-tier application? Okay, that's so pretty it's exciting. We've got developers <laughs> in the room who've built applications. A whole range of people. <laughs> so if we look at this diagram here, I mean, you know, the, in all honesty, this is a pretty standard diagram. I mean, we've got uh, a web tier, and we've got a business tier, and we've got SQL Server or some type of data tier in there, and I can see I've got some sort of Active Directory and a, and a jump box. It, this looks pretty standard. I mean, it's a very common diagram. Probably, given the number of hands we saw raised for who knew IaaS and PaaS, probably the overwhelming majority of people in this room are pretty comfortable looking at a diagram like this. It's pretty traditional. So, as I step back and look at this whole diagram of all these different components that are in here, let's go back to Obi Wan here. <laughs> and figure out where, where would we start yeah, with something so like this. Yeah, so kind of the way, you know, again, we, I talked to a lot of people and we talked about compliance and different things um, that people are having to do. And I mean, the first thing you want to think of is how are you securing the application and limiting who has access to it, right? So one of the easiest ways to do that is at a network boundary level. That's a very traditional thing that we've done in the past. Everyone's probably uh, administered a firewall here or there, um, or at least has cursed a firewall when you're trying to get to the resources that you need to. Um, so one of the first things that we can look at on the Azure side is, well, how could I do that in the cloud, and how could I begin providing a sec uh, isolated enclave? Now, traditionally, we might pull some wires in the data center, or we might have some firewalls that we're doing, um, but Azure, it's all virtual, right? So we're allowed to define these things with software, okay? And so one of the first things that we'll talk about from a network standpoint, Steve, is uh, something we call network security groups, okay? And uh, these are ACLs, very similar to what you would see in a firewall, that allow you to do where traffic goes. So if you've ever thought about how a firewall works, this diagram is probably pretty familiar to you, <laughs> basically. We're evaluating rules on an allow and deny and defining what traffic can traverse between two servers, between two networks, between any sort of resources that we have in our, um, in our virtual network. And so if we, go, um, if we go over here and look, so this is just a, a simple NSG that we brought up that actually is the default one, which has, by default, when you stand up a server, it's going to allow you to connect to RDP. That's helpful of our friends over in the compute networking team because you want to be able to get to a server to administer it. But if, say that I build, a, I build a VNet where I don't want to allow these things to go publicly, I have a jump box or a situation like that, I can very simply through the UI begin configuring these rules to change what sources it can come from. Maybe I only want it to be able to be RDP'd from the set of jump boxes that I have, which allows me to build a more restricted and controlled network where when I begin thinking about my planes of where people have data access, right, I can have a jump box that is accessible and maybe more restricted as to who can even log in and what can happen there. I can then have it, you know, access the rest of the resources for administration. Okay? This allows us to begin building concepts that are very familiar to us in the applications that we've been building traditionally. Okay. So should, as we talk about network security groups or NSGs, and, and I see you're, you're showing an example here of something that 
allows uh, 3389, so we can get to remote desktop. Yep. Should I think of NSGs the exact same way as a firewall, or should I think of it as different, or should yeah, I not so, even care too much about it? So yeah, I mean, they basically allow you to do similar things to firewalls to control the routing. Um, they, they are pretty, they are basic in that they are just allow deny point routes. Some of the uh, software you've looked at with you know, some of the more robust network security appliances that you may be familiar with um, can allow you to do more stuff and that's, we'll, we'll talk about those in just a second. Okay. So let's, yeah, let's go there. Um, so as we look at this, the next thing we talk about are the security appliances. So these are your firewalls on steroids that you may be familiar with. So a lot of our friends across various government agencies are, um, use things like the Cisco or the Barracuda to be able to do that. And so when I begin combining NSGs, which allow me to basically wall off traffic and force routes through certain pieces of traffic, I can now combine that with some of these virtual machines that, and virtual appliances, okay? So instead of having to buy a giant box, stick it in and wire it all up, I can now build those building blocks with my virtual stack. And then Azure does all the routing and mixing of traffic for you and gives you the opportunity to control it in ways that you're familiar with and that your compliance friends are familiar with, but that allows you to do it in a virtualized manner that is much more flexible, scalable, and ha gives you opportunities to do a lot more work with it. Okay? So Steve, what do you think? Okay. Can so we I secure think, the network? I think we're making good progress okay. here. Let's revisit the, is the network. Uh, there's one more. The next one. There's one, yeah, the, there's one more thing, though, that we want to talk about with the network. No, sorry. Go back to this. So, sorry. okay, as we <clears throat> think about what we've learned so far and revisit our picture here, I think things are starting to make a little more sense. So I know I have this virtual network that is the box surrounding all of this. We have a web tier and a business tier. I can think of those as subnets within yeah. my virtual network. And I can use NSGs to be able to dictate the rules, be, let's say, between the traffic between these subnets. So for example, I see I have a web tier and a business tier. I can have NSGs that dictate that, yes, communication can happen between the web tier and the business tier. But if I try to go between the web tier and, let's say, SQL, we have NSGs that prevent that. Say, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. That's not within compliance. But I would have another set of NSGs that do allow uh, traffic to go between my business tier and my SQL, my SQL tier, my data tier. Now, who in the room has found the networking configuration at their organization mystifying? Anybody? Uh, uh, you guys? Wow! That's it? Wow! <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I would I'm surprised. You guys must have really transparent network shops. <laughs> wow. So we, uh, yeah, in 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 different points, I worked with a lot of companies around, and networking was a giant mystery. And one of the things that's nice about this software-defined networking is that I can now build these images very quickly and crisply off of what is the network topology, what is allowed to talk to what, and we can see that in a, and interrogate it actually through software much easier. Okay, and so this allows us from a security and compliance standpoint to basically understand what it is and to validate it, but also to uh, better communicate what the rules of the road are. Now, who here, if you have a compliant application, allows traffic just to flow over the open internet? <laughs> we typically don't want the internet. People think the internet, yeah. So the, the open internet is a, a, where a lot of people run into things. And so one of the, th the things that Steve mentioned early on was our express route solution. And so express route ties directly into these VNets and allows you to basically extend your on-premises network off of these VNets. So I can now build a virtual network and then I can have a connection out to the rest of my uh, on-premises network that I can expose this application to other applications that are already residing in my data center or to my end users and things like that. So that combination of express route giving you private connectivity uh, between your VNet and your, uh, your, co your, your core network um, allows you to really build an application that's secure up in the cloud and connect it in a secure way. Okay, so what do we see here? So we got a network defined. Yeah. Um, I think the next thing we'll talk about is what do we do with all these virtual machines here? So um, have you ever had to patch a virtual machine? It's not the most fun thing to do. Y yeah, no, I, I've always... I'd rather uh, be spending my time writing code. Writing code, right. yeah. So there's a couple of things that can happen here. So first off, because you're scaling all this out, um, you, can, you can bring your own images still if you want. You'll still have to patch and do some of those things. Um, you could even, you know, per you know there's pre-configured images out there. Um, but really, what there are two things that are kind of interesting here as we talk about the virtual machines. So number one is patching. So if I'm using ExpressRoute and I've extended my network, 
I can use my current patching technology to basically continue patching. I can take inventory and do patching as I do today. I can also do something called, we use our operational management suite. So OMS is a product deployed in Azure Gov. There's a dedicated Azure Gov instance for you guys that is accredited and everything. And basically what that OMS does is it allows you to begin using a cloud-based service to automate patching and management of those servers if you want. Now, we'll talk about PaaS more in a moment, but it still would be great if I could get rid of this virtual machine altogether. So we'll table that and look at it there. The next thing, though, is antivirus. Now, again, we're extending our on-prem infrastructure. I can bring my own antivirus if I want. But Microsoft also has antivirus um, on its out there that you can install on the servers. And so we're going to take a quick look at how difficult it is um, to do the antivirus. So as you can see, sorry, Steve's a better demo guy than I am. Let me just make this bigger for you all. OK. So basically, there's a what I'm going to load here is a little configuration file. And this configuration file, you could deploy across hundreds or a whole fleet of servers if you wanted. And it basically says, how do I configure this? So I can configure when do we run full scans, um, how do I do extensions, excluded folders, all sorts of stuff like this. Very nicely defined. I don't have to go into the GUI and click that stuff. And then all I have to do from PowerShell is I load that file in. And then I can basically set the Azure extension. And if we look at this application, uh, this server, we can see right now there's no resource extension loaded. I can simply run through. Basically, I'm saying, hey, for this server that I called um, Jumpbox, I want to be able to deploy the uh, IaaS anti-malware extension. And I'm going to leverage the settings that we had in that JSON file. So it goes out there. It deploys. It configures it. And then it will actually have the antivirus running on the schedule and with the settings that we said there. And now I can meet one of those checkboxes about am I making sure that I've got antivirus running on my machine and that it's being kept up to date. OK, we'll let this run. It, sometimes All it right, takes a so minute. <coughs> if, so. I, if I understand everything yeah. we just saw here, we have a JSON file that defines the configuration yep. of the uh, antivirus. And let's take another look at that again. OK, so it's which extensions it's, it's enabling, the processes. And because I can load that JSON file into configuration, now once I have it in PowerShell, I can just run the script. So I may have 100 VMs. I can just script uh, the automation of that and, and apply this uh, antivirus to 100 VMs in, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a single shot. Yep. Let's talk about one more thing. We'll come back to that. It'll finish up in just a second, I promise. Um, the next thing is encryption at rest, right? So one of the big things that we talk about is that even for your virtual machines, you need to be encrypting at rest for a you know, to make sure that the data is not getting out, the data is not leaking. So how do we encrypt at rest for disks? Um, Azure has a great tech, or sorry, Microsoft has a great technology of BitLocker, and we basically brought that to the cloud. So what you can do is you can. Uh, you basically have a key vault, the, and a key vault is our secure HSM solution in the cloud. It allows you to store keys and secrets uh, in, encrypted, and you can control who has access and how those are managed. And your virtual machine is then bit lockered. Its keys are stored up in key vault. And now all of your machines that are running virtual machines, everything in our friendly little diagram, can be bit lockered and encrypted at rest. So all the disks that you're using, all the storage is encrypted, and you can meet that compliance marker really easily. OK, let's see here. OK, Just checking back in on our nope, antivirus. Done, it uh, it was successful. Long. And if we go yeah, back over here. like double click and next, 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 and do a big installation process. And if we refresh here, we will now see that for our friend Jumpbox, we now have an anti-malware extension provisioning succeeded. So um, you can see these things in the portal. You can interrogate them all through software. You understand up and down the stack how these things are working, how they're configured, and how they, how they go. OK. So Steve, we secured the network. OK, I'm feeling good here. We got the network. We got our subnets, NSGs in place. We're talking about encrypting our, our VMs. What's the next thing we're looking at here? Authentication? Or? Yeah, so, so identity becomes a big thing, right? And so we talked a lot about, and something we talk a lot internally about, is using identity to better you know, control your applications. And we've always had Active Directory. Um, and so one of the things that you can do with some of these legacy applications is you can actually bring your identity with you. 
And you don't even necessarily have to use Azure Active Directory for this. What we have on this diagram is I basically brought two domain controllers up to the cloud. I've put those, I can put those domain controllers running, and then the applications can authenticate just as they've done previously against those domain controllers. So all of your existing policies around how HR manages your users, how passwords are managed, password enforcement, even multi-factor authentication, if that is the case, can be utilized for your application in the cloud running as it does today. Okay, so that, that is a nice benefit to allowing you to bring a lot of that overhead that you might have to otherwise have a conversation about. I can just use um, the Azure Active Directory that we've used traditionally. And yeah, cool. so that kind of brings us to the end. So basically, we've got a compliant application. We were able to deploy some antivirus. We talked about encrypting the disks and making sure that we have all that secure. And we've isolated the networking. And so we've actually come a long way in building our application to making sure that we've got a lot of the pieces in place to have a conversation with how our application is protected. Still a lot of conversation to talk about documenting operational procedures and stuff like that. I don't know that I can exactly help you out with that. But we can definitely do a lot to bring the pieces uh, into a secure manner. So if we, if we think about what we've done here, effectively what we've been focusing on is a lift and shift. Yep. We've said, okay, we know we have this existing application that's been running in our data center. It has a certain network topology, and we want to essentially replicate this up into the cloud. Can we just lift and shift our stuff somewhere? Yes, you can, and we can do it. And whether you're, you need to create subnets or NSGs to accommodate that, we, we've shown you can absolutely do that. You need to have encryption. Uh, we can turn that on with a stroke of a PowerShell script. Uh, Active Directory, uh, Zach talked about. But we can get beyond lift and shift, right? We appear to all these, these higher level services. Oh we talk gosh. about backup first. We forgot one thing. Oh, all right, let's do, let's do this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nobody called me out that we didn't back up the server and have a DR plan. You, you guys are, OK, go ahead. You mentioned about the uh, authentication. Yeah. So the author is, yeah, so there's, okay, yeah, so there's two pieces of authorization when you think about it. So first off, from an application perspective, um, it depends on how the application is built largely, right? So the application is responsible for authorization for the most part. Now, Azure Active Directory has the concept of groups, and you can basically um, do permissioning based on groups. And if your application understands Azure Active Directory, it can leverage those groups for authorization. So the base of the JSON token, the always going to toss that token. Yeah, so the, 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 the XAML token, the, the, um, the, the auth token basically that Azure Active Directory provides to you, yeah. yeah, will provide you with the information about what the groups are. The actual authorization, though, the definition of what those groups then grant you access to is, is part of the application itself. Okay, So I can, I can define, if, if the app understands that I have a group called read-only users that only allows me to read the data, then that group can be defined in Active Directory and managed there. Okay, Does that make sense? Okay. Now, for administration, it's a little bit different. Because the, a the Azure understands those groups, OK? So I can now what we call role-based access controls within Azure, where I can basically define a group in Active Directory. I can define a group. That group then has members. And I can now grant that group SQL uh, administrator rights or read rights to my networking stuff. So it allows you to basically do role-based access controls within the portal, because our application does do that, OK? Um, yep. Right, so our role-based access control is primarily based on group membership. We are looking at how we bring in more kind of claims-based in other ways. Um, an office is doing a lot of this work actually, you know, kind of pioneering some of it ar around you know, location or other things as far as who gets access to what. So that, you know, as we continue to mature those capabilities, we will be bringing those in more, more green. It is not there yet. Yeah, what's up? The express route? Yes. It's in, so it'll be encrypted up to your meet me point where we meet you, and then we hand the traffic off to your network, and it goes from there. So that's where some people will put this, like a Cisco appliance on their virtualized side and have one on-prem. 
And then they actually encrypt it before we encrypt it. And that way it's encrypted all the way through if you want to do it that way. I mean, so we, you can do a, we have a VPN solution that we provide if you want. Um, it, but a lot of people prefer some, I mean, there, we, we'll support whatever you guys want to do. Um, and so a lot of people are already using things like Cisco or Barracuda, and so they'll just use their own. But yes, we have a VPN technology. But it that you is can also encrypted do. up to the meet me point automatically. Automatically, yeah. Um, so it's typically at a, like a carrier neutral facility like Equinex or something like this. Um, and so that's where we meet up with the, that's where we meet up with the other uh, carriers. I think he left. Oh, I don't see him anymore. He's big Sarkat guy. He supports the Sarkat. It's here at the front desk. If you guys have any ways to support the Sarkat. Yeah, and I mentioned there's, there's a whole session, session tomorrow on it. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning. So yeah, definitely check that yeah. out if that's something you want to get more detail on. OK. OK. So backup and disaster recovery. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. This is good. I want to be interactive, so yes, I love please. the question. Keep going. Just another uh, quick question. Yeah. On, um, Mm -hmm. uh, are there any plans on the roadmap for native support for Blitz Hard authentication? Hold on. Not Re repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. The question was: Is there any are, are there any plans for Azure Active Directory to natively support PIV card like multi-factor auth cards um, in Azure Active Directory? Not right now because that is all we kind of. And this is actually we'll we'll talk about this a little bit, but for a variety of reasons they have, you know, they retain control of the directory and a lot of that responsibility, and they are able to leverage their existing investments there, and so we've, that, that has continued there. We do have multi-factor authentication, but it's not based on the PIV card stuff. And, and on the multi-factor authentication, um, it's essentially uh, the evolution of phone factor, right? Yes. So are there plans for a Linux OS uh, MFA support? Oh. You can certainly hook in um, the two factor authentication, but if you're on a Linux box, at least to my knowledge, you can't do that yet. I don't know off the top of my head. We can follow up afterwards and I can get someone who knows that a little bit deeper. Yeah. Other questions while we're taking? Okay. okay. Now. All right, so backup. Backup. Steve, there's a challenge. Do you think we can backup these servers in less than one minute? We got a clock here. So we're going to say, I want to back up some virtual machines. I've got a default policy configured. I cheated a little bit. I'm going to select some stuff to back up. How about these three boxes? It's be. OK. It's coming in hot, if I can click. And here we go. Enable. OK. Deployment started. So now what it's going to do, basically, is Azure is going to take over for me and back up those servers once a day and will keep them stored for me in Azure storage. Uh, we can do geo replication, so the 500 miles is taken advantage of. And I now have a, a very uh, you know, effective solution where I can basically have backup for my system uh, and take advantage of it without having to deploy backup infrastructure, without having to maintain physical media or anything like this. It's replicated, it's maintained, and it's accessible. And I saw that you. And I saw you clicked a few buttons and checked a few check boxes. Could I do the same thing with PowerShell? Yes, this is all automatable through our ARM uh, resource providers, and you can do there. Okay, cool. Okay. When you do the actual backup, does it depend on the phone that you actually um, Repeat the question. So uh, the question sorry, was, does the yeah. backup affect the actual performance of the virtual machine? Um, I don't have specific numbers on that. I mean, there's probably, you know, it's backing up the the disk and everything, um, but it shouldn't be a significant performance hit that I'm aware of. Um, we can follow up on that with you. Yeah. So two questions. Like one, is this backup like a bare metal backup where it gives you know, the user the VM? Can I do that, or is it just the data portion? Uh, it's it's the backup of the VHD. Okay. And yeah. Then second is, can we use this for uh, physical servers? For physical servers, yes. You can do this on prem with physical servers. Yes. You just need to install the agent. So with, in this case, you don't install any agent or anything. It just does it because it's running in Azure. But you'd have to have the agent there. Uh, but you can download that all um, through here, through the portal. Hybrid, hybrid what? setup at the next session. Yeah, <laughs> Matt's, Matt's going to talk if you hang around. Uh, with the geo replication, yeah. does, um, does the client incur costs for essentially the traffic going outside of the region? 
Um, no, we don't charge for that replication traffic. So we just charge for the store. You, basically, there's a small, there's a uplift over the base locally redundant storage. So, but you that includes all the bandwidth charges. There's no bandwidth charge there. Yes. How much they, do? they do incremental backups, yeah. Um, I don't have specific space numbers, sorry. I'm falling short for you. <laughs> sorry, was there a question here? Yes. Oh, um, so, so the backups go through, I think, do you call it cool storage or hot storage? Um, so you, they're backed up basically to a blob account that can be geo replicated. They certainly can be cool or hot storage, depending on how you set up the account. service, part of our operations and management suite to take care of those things. So you're not caring about, am I spinning up or spinning down things appropriately? Am I moving, migrating things to the appropriate storage location to take advantage of those hot things? That's all built in. But you've got to write the automation script. Yeah, you, you would define the automation script. So we just let it run. <coughs> yeah. So there was no policy where I can say after 30 days, then it's going to cost storage. Well, no, so you can write, so cool storage primarily is a read cost if you're worried about it. So there's no real reason not to write straight to cool storage to start. So I, I think you could, there, you know, the, the difference between hot and cool storage is really the frequency of the reads. And so if you're just writing the backups, then you, sh you can write straight there. Okay. Is there any performance difference between <laughs> hot and uh, cool storage? No. It's primarily around your SLAs for reads. Um, and so you get a higher SLA for reads um, with out of hot storage uh, versus cool. So, but if you, and then you can, at any point, you can toggle the tier of your storage account depending on what you're doing. So you can move from hot to cool, cool to hot, depending on where you go. Okay. Other questions? Oh, yes, in the back. How is the performance for the encryption? on the BitLocker drives and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very good. So yeah, I don't have specific numbers on that, but it, it, I mean, that was the key scenario that, the, sorry, the question, I should repeat the question, was what is the performance of the backup when you're in, you have a BitLocker disk or something that's encrypted? And yeah, that's actually all supported straight through here and as part of that, uh, yeah, so it's been good. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Um, so the, if you had a, your own SSO, you would still be, you, there, sorry, you can't replace Azure Active Directory totally with a, another SSO, but if you uh, federate the directory, then you can, you can use your SSO to handle the actual authentication for you, okay? But Azure Active Directory would, you know, would proxy to your SSO, would handle the auth, and then would handle the token from that point forward, okay? Well, yeah? Um, we have that all, I want to, we're going to actually punt to go forward because we're only halfway, but yes, that's all in the documentation they talk about that. And when you guys have the slide deck, we actually link out to that backup docs that'll go into some of that stuff. Okay. And we'll actually talk interestingly in just a second about SQL backups. Okay. okay. So, so see, we, we talked a lot about a legacy, uh, a traditional application. We're not going to call it legacy. They're still out there and very popular. Um, but let's talk about maybe a more modern application design that takes advantage of Pat. So what's going on here? Okay, so to me, I look at this, and I'm as a developer, autom automatically a lot more comfortable with this because this is some of these higher level services that I, I've maybe already been familiar with using Azure Commercial. So we have a website. The website's going to talk to a database or a Redis cache. Uh, I can still have virtual networks. I can still have network security groups. I see we're talking to blob storage and file storage. We have Docker containers. We have a lot going on here, a lot, a lot going on. But some things I'm not having to worry about is because I don't have direct VMs that I'm deploying my code on. I don't have to worry about patching those OS. So automatically my compliance responsibility has become less. 
Um, and frankly, as a developer, I am not having to think about the fact that, oh, I need to deploy this website onto 10 instances. I can just push a button and it scales up without having to spin up a whole new VM. So when I come to something like this, what's the first thing we should start with when we start thinking about compliance? We know our yeah. compliance story is already better because there's less stuff we have to do, yeah. more stuff Microsoft is taking care of for us. Yeah, so we're really worried about securing these applications and the data. When we talk about the applications, we're still worried about identity. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that. Um, I want to make sure that data is still staying safe, staying encrypted, and things like that. So let's take a look at a few pieces where we might be able to do that that will help you out here. Okay, so Azure Storage. So we talked about disks. Disks actually sit in Azure Storage, but you can do BitLocker encryption. That feels very familiar. But as I begin looking at blobs, queues, and tables, the, the blob storage in particular, I can, I can encrypt very easily. Um, using the storage service encryption. So you mean I don't have to grab a .NET C# -sharp library and hide my my encryption key and yeah. have make sure I, I have know. a complex cipher. Are you ready for this, Steve? I'm going to show you. All right, it's, let me put my seat belt seat belt on here. Everybody, hold on. This will take a few minutes to do. It's going to be very complex. <sighs> okay, encryption. We're going to enable it. We're going to save it. Okay. Do you guys need to see that again? It went by pretty quick. Okay, so basically. <laughs> I know it's the wrong time to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a roll. Didn't, don't you have to move the data out and move it back in? If you I was going to mention that. We haven't started <laughs> so, our app yet. I know, there is a cap. So the question was don't we have to move the data out and then move it back in before we can do what Zach just did? Yeah, so basically what this does is it will encrypt from this point forward. So any new data that is written, you can read and rewrite data for right now. Um, they are working on, I will just say, making this experience better. And so be on the lookout for some en enhanced features here as, they, as we come forward. Okay. So yeah, that is a big caveat. You're very totally correct because I would hate for anyone to click the button and say, voila, I'm done, and then come to find out later it is not encrypted. Now, this is transparent encryption. So basically, anyone who has access to the storage account will will read the data unencrypted. It's very nice for your application uh, to meet that compliance requirement of encryption at rest. So the data will be encrypted when it sits on the server. So the, there is another way that you can do it. And so Steve, if you were looking for the C-sharp way with the keys and everything, our storage libraries actually have built-in capabilities to do client-side encryption if you want to own the keys and own the secret all the way through. So you can do the client-side encryption with your own cert and key, retain that cert either in Key Vault or in some sort of on-prem store if you're after it. Um, and then that will, key, that will encrypt the data before it actually goes into the blob storage, which uh, gives you a different layer depending on what type of data you're looking at to do that encryption. I kind of like this way. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. Um, there's two other things that we want to talk about here. So we talked about high availability or backup. So we don't... Um, when we talk about high availability, you can enable uh, geo-redundant storage. And there's two types of that. There's the RAGRS, which basically provides you with read access to your secondary copy. So we mentioned things are 500 miles apart. So what happens with geo-redundant storage? When I write to it, we make three copies of it within the data center just to make sure you don't lose it. And then we copy it over to another data center that's 500 miles away and keep it over there. Okay, so. What I could do actually with an RAGRS is I could have an application that if I'm unable to access my primary copy, I can still read my data from another data center. Okay? And if we were to lose a whole data center, your data is fine and safe. And so this is automatic backup as you go forward and your application is actually using. That data is, is replicated all the time. Okay? So that handles basically the high availability um, and, and kind of a disaster recovery checkbox there. Was there a question? Yes, in the back. OK, so is there a restore point in time? So this is the one limitation of this strategy, um, is that there's, it's not a point in time restore. So it enables you to meet your disaster recovery opportunities. If you're looking to basically um, be able to roll back data, there's others, you'd have to go with another strategy or approach for that. Um, and, but, but yes, so different point there. Yep. OK. Um, the, the third point that we'll talk about is access control. So storage accounts are managed with uh, storage access keys and SAS signatures, basically. So the storage access key, there's a security guide that, that we have the link up here to that you'll be in the slides that basically talks about how to protect and roll your keys. 
You want to be able to roll these access keys frequently, and you can do all of that to make sure that your apps have, uh, you're, you're not seeing that data leak at all. Then the storage access signatures, you can actually apply ACLs to in a similar way to limit who can even access those uh, using those storage access signatures from where. So I can restrict to certain ranges of IPs and things like that. So I could limit it to just my VNet, to just my application. OK? Other questions about storage? OK. Let's talk about SQL. So. Have you ever had to encrypt SQL data oh, before? This is, uh, again, something I feel like I need a C-sharp library, and I need to salt my password, and any, any other thing i got to come up with. Secure my, my encryption key. OK, I have a database here. You wait for this, Steve. As it comes up. OK, here we go. Done. Encrypted. So it does actually go in, this one does, it does transparent data encryption on the database. This is very similar, this is the same technology if you're using SQL Server on-prem to do transparent data encryption today. Now, we talked about storage replication. How, has anybody ever had to replicate a database around the globe? It's usually pretty trivial, right? It's easy, there's no hard, uh, okay, maybe not. Okay, so apart from one of our data centers being up in Canada on this one, I don't know what's going on there. Um, I can basically come down here and I can tell SQL that I want to go ahead and replicate this SQL Azure database to um, our other region. So I have it deployed in our, our Iowa data center. It will replicate it over to Virginia. As the new Texas and Arizona data centers come online, you can replicate to either of those. And basically you just configure a server and it handles all of the replication for you and keeps them in sync. Okay, and so this is just a, a great way that really the cloud service that we're bringing to you in SQL Azure, when you're building a modern application, I no longer have to worry about the OS. I'm not worried about configuring multiple deployments in these two areas. I'm able to just basically say, I want these databases replicated, and I want them to be scaled out uh, in those separate data centers for me, okay? So this capability, really, when I begin talking about it, how do I make my app highly available? How do I make my app secure? We're, being to get, we're seeing more and more the tools that I can do this. Now, um, how often do you think you've had a database that just has a SQL password? Pretty common for an application. It'd be nice if I could do something with Active Directory, though, because we've, we've talked about how we've done all this good work on, um, on making sure that we have our identity in the cloud, we can federate with your different SSO things, and when we do this, I can actually come back over here to our actual server, and I can actually connect it up to where instead of having a SQL Server admin, I can use one of my Active Directory users that are bound to my subscription. And so in here, I can select from anyone in our directory that we have associated with this subscription, and they can now begin using their Active Directory accounts. And I can actually go into the database and mirror my Active Directory users over and begin granting permissions to them and using Active Directory groups and things like that within my SQL Azure database in the cloud to begin doing security and things like that. Yes, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. trying to remember exactly. I, be, it, I believe it's active passive by default. I'd have to go back and You're talking about check. SQL replication? Yeah. The question was, is it active active yeah. or active passive? I believe it is active passive. Yeah. So it's small. I mean, the, the, one of the big things is that even with the 500 miles, we have latency requirements because of the fiber between the two. So we have our own fiber that's running between those two data centers. So the, the actual latency and lag time is pretty minimal, um, but it still is present. I don't have exact numbers off the top of my head there, but I do have the, I, I did link to the documentation there where we have more about that. So we can talk about uh, Did you have a comment? Wait, we also have multi-replication within a single region. Yes. So the odds of losing all three of your copies within Sorry. one region yes. is very low. And, and I just have to add here, I mean, because I, I saw the number of hands that went up. When, who's familiar with IaaS? So I believe I'm sitting in front of in a room, I'm sitting in front of a room with people that a lot, with a lot of familiarity on this stuff. Think about what we're talking about here. You're talking about a SQL server, and if a developer writes a, a row to the SQL server, 
it's automatically replicated to three locations within the region and replicated to another data center 500 miles away. I mean, if you were to have to support something like that in your own data center, I mean, let's, that's a non-trivial amount of work. Microsoft's doing that for you and click the button and you get you know, encryption for, for free. So there's a lot of stuff going on behind the yeah. scenes here. Yes, sir. Okay, so we, um, we talk about it a little bit differently. So we just have, right now we have, one, we call them just a data center. And so with, with, so a region is, there's, there are different physical buildings that comprise a region, but from an end user perspective, it's all viewed as one block, which is a region. So the we. Right, so we spread them across. We have different, when you look in the building, there's, it's designed with, with fault domains and things like that, so that if, if we lose, one, we make sure that it's not on the same rack or on the same cluster. The, the replication that's happening is spread out across the physical facility. But we don't want you to have to think about that. Like, you, you, were, you were thinking of the terms of, you know, U.S. government Virginia, U.S. government Iowa, and then, you know, you let Microsoft worry about what's happening inside Virginia, what buildings but, and, and whatnot. All right, so yeah, so let's just say, so we, um, yeah, so we are, so we, we, there's a couple of things, so yeah, so I mean, I think all of the major cloud providers, and we'll just own this, are working through what this op means operating at this kind of scale, okay? And so, you know, we have had our own hiccups in the past, um, and they have certainly had theirs, and so I think, you know, we are working through as we look at how we automate and roll out code and control things to, to deal with some of those same problems. Um, we have actually had conversations, we had conversations internally about our disaster recovery plan for our uh, service availability dashboards and things like that for public is something that we have focused on and, and have addressed in certain areas. So I think we're, we're all moving through this here and so I'm, I, I, will, uh, I will hold off on taking any shots there because the shoe may be on the other foot at some point is all I'll say. Okay, you have a question. Go ahead. Personal since you guys do Amazon, does Amazon have a concept of a delivery zone within each region? Yep. You said separated centers that are pretty much like a couple hundred miles within each region. Is that? I think they're less than less 50, 50 miles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, so the, the, yeah. It's not a bold move. Like, do you have a concept like that that you just have? So the, the question is on availability zones. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, so what do we do with availability zones? So we do not have availability zones right now. Uh, on you get in gov. In gov. Yeah. So we do not have availability zones right now in gov. They have just entered preview for us in our public, uh, in our public data, in our public region. So they're coming. So the the availability zones give you more control in a tight region where latency is is close enough that VMs can move more easily between those those uh, data centers there. Uh, we do not have that exposed. We do make sure that, like I said, that the virtual machines are spread out somewhat across, you know, if you're doing like uh, storage replication that we're not across clusters, but they're, if they are in the same, you know, the, sorry, the one data center or multiple data centers that make up a region are there, they're just not exposed to you, if that makes sense. So we don't, we don't, we, we don't have the same concept of availability zones right now, but that concept is coming and will be here, you know, will we'll be there in Gov eventually. Okay, so in the follow-up question, uh, specifically the session is about uh, GovCloud. Yes. So how would GovCloud be different from the regular Azure? What does it differ to? Can you see some uh, advantages of GovCloud as opposed to the regular Azure? Yeah. So there's several things that we think about. So the first on our goal and my goal on my team is that you don't have to think about differences. Okay? So what we are doing is we took a we took a high bar compliance approach where we basically engineered a cloud that managed um, across the DOD, across federal, across uh, state and local with CGIS and things like this. So we have, um, uh, it's a community that you have to you know, either be part of government or selling to government to be part of. Everything stays in the US, everything's managed. But as you can begin seeing with the portal, the portal looks and feels the same. The technology is the same. So the biggest, there are two big things when you look at the gov cloud. Um, that are different. The first one is how we manage it and that we reconstructed it. And then the limitation that 
unfortunately is still there, is that we don't necessarily have full feature parity with the public cloud. But as we bring things in, we are bringing the exact same code and the code then stays up to date with the government cloud. So as we're getting new enhancements to storage or as we're getting new enhancements to our virtual machines, those things are rolling out to the gov cloud and you have access to them. So basically, as we continue closing that gap of feature parity, which as you saw with the 100 things that rolled by, we've done a lot too and we'll continue to close that gap. Basically what you're left with is an opportunity to build compliant and secure apps in a container basically that has been already certified to meet the baseless, you know, the baseline compliance that you need for most of the workloads and most of the operations uh, for government customers. So when I'm designing an application for the Gov Cloud specifically, where can I find a particular uh, limitation? What services I cannot use? Yep. So if you go, um, there's two things. So one is, and we'll have this link at the end, um, so the, the question is, if he's designing an application for the government cloud, how does he understand what the, if there are any limitations, or if there are certain services that maybe are in Azure public but not in Azure government, where you can find? And if we go to our documentation, there's a link. So, so yeah, this is our documentation site that we have, and we actually have down available here. Available services. We have the available services, and what you can do, there's also the regions page. We have a regions page where we list all the services that are available, but this is where we talk about the different services that are present, and then we begin linking to documentation that talks specifically about them for government. So for instance, on the virtual machine front, we talk about what regions and what SKUs are available. Um, we also begin talking about data handling considerations and things like that. You might also see for something like the databases, we also highlight the, this is the other subtle difference, we use different URLs because they're different instances. We don't want you routed to public stuff. So one of the things that you'll see with applications that may have hard-coded stuff to public URLs because they assumed that all blobs would always end in the same URL, that you have to take into account that these URLs are different, but we document them here in the documentation so that you have that clarity around what that is. Okay, other questions? Yeah, what's up? I'm not recommending it. Sorry, let me go back here. Yes? On your application, if there's another security breach in the virtual network, is that in Azure Gov today in the web app? Ah. Funny you should ask. Funny you should ask. <laughs> uh, yes, so we're actually publishing a blog on how to do this. We d normally, it's part of the app services environment. We do not have app services environment right now, but we do have through PowerShell the ability to configure it. So look for a blog or I can shoot you an email on that. Come afterwards. And this is the feature that's brand new. So it that allows you to use your application gateway with your web application firewall that's in Azure Go? It should. Okay. I'd have to double check, but yeah. That, I mean, that's the idea is that basically now you can put things behind and restrict them in a way that you know you would normally be able to. Certain app plans, no, not that I'm aware of. I don't think you can run it like on the free tier. The, okay. The, yeah. I'll double check and make sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate on the domain controller? Is that like a dedicated domain controller? Uh, yeah. So in this diagram, that bottom box is kind of if you brought like a legacy piece of your application. So the what we were thinking is basically, if I had something say that was doing contract processing, for instance, and I had some legacy business logic that was built in, I could bring a portion of my application, still be doing you know, a jump box and uh, domain controllers like we were looking at before, but I can now layer on all these PaaS services on top of it and still build an application that's end-to-end -end working for me. In a, in a traditional path, it's still something that Microsoft controls. It's not something that... It, uh, sorry, if you're talking about authentication, um, for in most of our PaaS services, the authentication would be through either Azure Active Directory or some sort of secret exchange such as tokens or, um, or keys. Is that like a OU that I control or is that? No, no, sorry, this is purely, there, this is as though the, the whole box would be empty and you brought your own domain controller. There is no Azure domain controller in the cloud there. There, is no, there are no policies getting pushed out that? No, there's no policies, these are raw VMs. If you uh, put your domain controller and join to those things to the domain, then you could push policies to them, but there's no policies being pushed. Correct. Okay, other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, we did want to talk briefly, we, we, we touched on this with your question over here a little bit about SSO. 
But Azure Active Directory is a key piece to securing your data and securing your application. And the first thing is, is that when you're federating your identities from a compliance perspective, there's a lot of rules around who, uh, how quickly you have to retire people out of your system, how, you know, what you can do uh, with user management and with multi-factor authentication. And so what a lot of our large customers have done is set up Active Directory Federation Services, ADFS, to, and federated their identity with Azure Active Directory. This has a couple of key benefits, right? If you already have processes and things in place, for instance, from an HR perspective, to retire users out of your directory when they leave or when they have problems, those policies all still apply and work because your directory on-prem is still the authority, okay? Uh, the second thing is that if, you're, if you already have a multi-factor authentication setup that you're using with, you know, cat cards from DOD or other things, then that is all handled as part of the ADFS handshake and does not, does not you know, is done with and under your control as far as which users you grant access. And only once uh, you have decided to grant access will Active Directory then trust the token and issue a token that allows them to continue moving through the system, either through Office 365 or for your uh, PaaS application that you've built that federates with, you know, that uses Azure Active Directory as your identity provider. Okay? Um, and so really what this allows you to do is have uh, you know, a scalable identity solution that can be used across the board. And so as you write applications, many of your customers are already using Office 365. As you saw, you know, we, we have a lot of government customers that are using Office 365 today. Their domains are federated into the cloud. They have already managed and decided how that works. Your applications can then adopt that and they no longer have to worry about how they sort out authentication uh, with those user groups and allow to kind of inherit that modern auth capability. Yes, exactly. It's the exact same. So Office 365 uses Azure, Act sorry, the question is, is the model the same as Office 365? Yes, absolutely. Azure Active Directory is Microsoft's identity solution across our cloud, whether it's CRM, Office, or Azure. And so what you'll see is, is that as we deepen integration across Azure with Active Directory, you already have it in Office 365. We're really moving to, and this is something you know, Matt spoke of and can talk more about, but identity really is the key to the kingdom as far as protecting data. It's not necessarily about network boundaries, but it's how do I secure that with permissions and with applications. And so we're, Azure Active Directory is the backbone of that for Microsoft's cloud. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So we, we reached the end, we actually did good here. I think, Steve, do you know a little bit more? Uh, I, I feel educated now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody else is educated a little bit. So these are some resources, they'll be in there. So seriously, check out the Blueprint stuff. It's a great uh, getting started on this type of conversation around how do I build a compliant application. Uh, there's uh, Microsoft's Azure Security Guidance also has a lot of good resources on using our things in a secure manner. Um, there we go. Okay, I'll okay. got some pictures, I'll wait just a second. You got a question, go ahead. Uh, we do not provide that capability right now. With what? one potential workaround. Oh. Bad PM. Oh. If you take the whole blade, yeah. then you but are effectively on your own. But that's the only, there's no pinning sort of capability. What was the question again? The question was, do we allow, do we have any sort of uh, ability to have your VM on a dedicated host? And we do not have that capability today. Yes. Yes. So funny you should ask that, because <laughs> we, we demoed it this morning. There's an entire session tomorrow on cognitive services in Azure Gov. So yes is the answer to your question, and that was also combined with a plug to my session tomorrow on cognitive services. Yeah, so let's actually flip over there. So if you're looking for other Gov-specific sessions, we've got a bunch of them over the next few days. Um, I'll leave this up here. You guys can come check it out. Uh, the, the cognitive services, as he said, we're in the process of deploying to Gov now. So we're taking some preview interest, if you want. You can come up and we can, I can get your email um, as we're beginning to look at onboarding customers uh, to that. But yes, definitely, we view cognitive services as a big differentiator for government customers and a big benefit to being able to do mission-based you know, workloads. So yes? Uh, 
Is that, is that taken care of for us? Or yes. Anything, or so, uh, yeah. can, you, can you talk about it? So, so repeat that. The question yeah. is for, for websites or databases as a service or um, things like that that are platform as a service, are things like antivirus and patching taken care of for you? Is that correct? That and backups. Backups, yeah. Is that all so, like yeah. So, for, the, for antivirus, patching, any of that stuff, that is all taken care of. So, that's part of the work that our compliance teams have done to get those services signed off. We've said, like, we patch and manage these things. So, you have no access to the OS, nothing to patch. When it comes to backup, it's a service by service question on what you're backing up and what you need. So for instance, on websites, there is a capability to do backups, but if you're just deploying raw code, you don't even need to back it up. It's just a deployment thing. Databases, backups are built in actually for SQL Azure. So depending on your tier, we keep backups automatically for either five days, 30 days, or I believe 90 days. And you can roll back to any time within that window. So to the question that was asked previously about, uh, you know, point in time, you can do that with SQL Azure uh, based on you know, whether you're paying for the free standard or premium tier. Okay? And so the, the premium tier, the backup goes back significantly further than the other ones. So okay. it's a lot easier to yeah, get Yeah, it's super easy. No tape, unpass. nothing like that. Okay, other questions? Yes? Ah, yes. <laughs> If you want to go in, to the open in, source. At, in three, at 3.15, in 15 <laughs> minutes from now, I will be giving a session upstairs on the eighth floor on open source, and we but will be talking yes, about Yes, are, we are fully, you know, this is you know, a very different Microsoft from 10 years ago, though. So um, Linux is a huge workload for us on these things. We support, you know, all the Node.js and things like that there. Uh, so you can, you can run these workloads across our fleet. Um, and we, we and we're looking to bring more and more of that support to Azure government when it's so there's a public has my SQL as a service we're looking at how do we bring that in how do we look at um, you know what we're doing with other workloads as we look at what do uh, Linux based websites look like okay okay so we're we're hitting our time here so I, I'll cut us off but we will hang around for a few more minutes in between yep. sessions so if you guys have additional sessions you guys can come up and talk to us but uh, thanks everyone for coming yeah we really appreciate it guys thank you